scripture to all of us. And I think you have all seen in the Sunday bulletin,、uh, you will see the word well, worship, evangelism, love, and learn. All those directions in our Sunday bulletins and the goals of it for this year. Now, now we're gonna <clears throat> have this vision and mission is this by building up step by step through Sunday worship service, teaching, evangelism, and small group bonding. Now, I don't think this is a new directions, and I don't think this is a new idea because because the idea has been、um, exists in the Bible itself, but. When I was thinking of the sermon, what to preach in accordance if with this vision and mission for this year,、um, to be honest, we can listen and we can learn all those characteristics and idea from many books in the Bible. So I would say I have a hard time to find what book is the most suitable books、um, to go through, to learn, and to be nurtured. So after praying and looking through the different volumes, and I found that Philippians almost、um, have a lot of concept of well quality, and you will see how Paul encourages us to live a Christ-centered life. If you see chapter one, verse twenty-one, you will see to live is Christ, and that means all our lives. It's about Christ. It is a Christ-centered life. And you will see Paul's heart for evangelism. And for most of us who study the Bible, you will know that Paul was in the prison at this moment. And while he was in prison, he still advances the gospel. And he doesn't think he did. He didn't think that to be in the prison is a torture for him. But in some way, he still advances the gospel. Now, just for your knowledge and information,、um, the Book of Philippians is called a friendship letter, and it is also called a prison letter because it is written in prison by the Apostle Paul. Now, of course, it is a friendship letter, and that works well and in line with what our direction is: love, bonding. And you will see that the affection and Paul's love for the church. You will see how he prayed for the church, his love for the church. We've just we've just gone through the book of Galatians last year, and you have you've seen and experienced that how Paul rebuked and he scolded the Galatian church. And for those of us who have gone through the book of Romans, it's a lot of full of theological ideas. But in the book of Galatians. You would sense and you would experience there is a unique relationship between Paul and the church. Paul loves the church, and likewise, the church, the Philippian church, loves the apostle Paul. And it is a wonderful and a sweet harmony and unity picture in this sense. So almost all the qualities of well come from the book of Philippians. Now, perhaps you might wonder what happened before the Philippian church. How was the Philippian church planted? Was it a group of people, brothers and sisters, moved from their mother church to a new place, and then they set up, established a new church, just like what we did today? Were there many people involved in worship from the beginning? So, as usual, you know my practice. Before I begin. Um, preaching from the book, I will usually、um, run through the background of the book first, and there I will start preaching uh, through um, from chapter one, verses one to two. So first of all, I want to preach from the book of Acts, as you can see from the Sunday bulletin in the sermon outline, and you can see also in the slides above. I will start preaching from the Book of Acts, and then later on I will be going into the Book of Philippians. Now it was about twenty years after the crucifixion of Jesus that just one afternoon a little group of people were heading to the northwest, and they came to the port of Neapolis from Troas, and only a few days ago. Now before that, I want、like、to remind、uh, this morning. I will mostly、um, 
focusing on the background and also the history and some map and geographical、uh, maps. So I would like to you to to have some attention of it. So there are many people who may pass by this little group of people on this way, and some may think these people are unimpressive. But little do they know that this group of missionary team they have already have a title of turning the world upside down. This missionary team have already turned the world upside down, and these people include Silas, Jan Timothy, Luke the physician, and of course the leader of the missionary team is the Apostle Paul. Now this is Apostle Paul's second missionary trip. Now it was in this normal way this Paul's missionary team entered the European lands. They had only one message to preach the crucified and the risen Savior to this land. Now the,、uh, their arrival to this land might be unnoticed, might be unimpressive, but they did not hesitate to preach the word of God. Now the original plan. Was not to go to Philippi. The original plan was to go to elsewhere. Now they had been through places like Phrygia, which is you can see at the second number two, and Galatia number one, Phrygia and Galatia, and they seemed to be planning to preach in the province of Asia. They want to go to Asia first, but there was some kind of un- some kind of supernatural power that God used to stop them. To preach in Asia. Now they try to cross Messiah, and they want to preach and plant a church right there. But God also said no to that place. So they had no choice but they continued their way to Troas, which which is at the fourth. Now surely, if we were in their shoes, we would be confused about God's interruptions and wonder what God had in mind. Now what's difference? By planting a church in Asia, by planting a church in Messia, and in the province of Asia, what's difference by setting a church in these places? Why God say no to this place? But this confusion did not last long because on one night Paul received a vision, which is a famous vision we know in the Book of Acts, chapter sixteen, a Macedonian vision, a dream. One Macedonian. Pleading with the apostle Paul, and saying that come over to Macedonia and help us, which is in chapter sixteen, verse nine. So the team discuss the fact that God has closed the door to Asia, to Messia, and then they all agree that this is the vision from God, and they all. Believe in unison. God has indeed called us to Macedonia to preach the gospel, and so they sailed from Troas, and then they went on to the five, the fifth spot, Samothrace, and then they sailed to Neapolis, and then the last station, it is in Philippi. So the original plan wasn't、um, to go to、um, Philippi. The original plan was to go to Asia to plant a church in Asia. So the city of Philippi was named after Philip the Second of Macedonia, the father of the man we know, the great Alexander. So after the Roman occupation of this land, it became a city, a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. Now, in many ways, we can know that it is governed by Roman law. But here's the thing. When Paul and his team came to this place, now they found out that there was not one single synagogue in Philippi. Now, as we all know, Paul usually they will he will went to the synagogue, Jew synagogue, to preach the gospel. He will first go there to find the Jews and say that Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah to the Jews, but. They couldn't find one single synagogue in that place, because which also means that they were less than ten Jewish men in that city. Because according to the Jewish requirements and the law, you must have ten men in order to set up a synagogue. So they have no choice 
they came out of the gates of the city to the river, and thinking that that could be the place of worship and prayer, and then they saw women, a lot of women, right there, and they start to speak and preach to those women. At sixteen, verse thirteen. And the first lady, the first one to be converted was Lydia, a businesswoman with a wealthy family and servants, and she generously invited this group of missionaries to stay in her house and accept her hospitality. Now it is likewise that the first church in Philippi was started in Lydia's house, and then later on Eurodia. Sintaich, two women later on were also converted to be a most important leader in the church. So we see a valuable teaching, brothers and sisters. The gospel and the teaching of the Bible are essential if we are to start a church. There can be a few people, but as long as the church, the preacher. The brothers and sisters are faithful in preaching and listening to the word of God. God will surely give the church the people who will be saved. So this is my encouragement and my thoughts. The church should not be afraid of a small number of people, but the church should be afraid that the church will not be faithful in preaching the Bible, and that's the one we should be afraid of. But here's here's the thing. The founding of the church is not always a smooth process, because Paul found out that he had to take risks, and that kind of risk would affect the safety and the ministry in Philippi, and also for his missionary team. Because in the city, as we have all know, some people were cruelly using a girl, a lady possessed by a demon, to perform tricks. Evil for the financial gain, and this demon-possessed lady caused trouble for Paul's team. She followed them, crying out and screaming that these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Now that kind of situation put a great pleasure on the team and the Apostle Paul, but Paul tolerated it for many days. Paul knew that he had took some kind of actions against these women, but he—I bet he also knew that it will also came with a great risk and price. And after so many days of this shouting, screaming, Paul could not stand it any more, and he had to take some actions by casting out the demons from this lady in the name of Jesus. And this lady, as we all know, she was safe. Now Paul and Silas, they have to pay the price. The owners of this girl, they was fear. They were fearers of the loss of their fortunes. The crowd joined and attacked the team, and the and they were sent to the magistrates.、Um, the the clothes were tear tore off, and they were beaten by rods, and they were put into the jail. But it was in the it was in the Philippine prison. That one of the most famous conversions in the church history took place, and suddenly there was a great earthquake. So the foundation of the prison was shaken. The jailer was terrified because if most of the、um, prisoners would escape from the jail, because he needs to bear the great responsibility, and when the jailer was about to kill himself, and Paul screamed and shouted to him. To stop him from killing himself to commit suicide, and assure that all the prisoners were still there, none had escaped. And then the jailer rushed to the apostle Paul and Silas and asked the question that has been passed down through the ages: What must I do to be saved? Later on, Paul preached the gospel, believe in Jesus Christ, you and your family will be saved. And then, likewise, Lydia's family and this jailer's family all were baptized. That was the joyful and the sweet moment in the city of Philippi. So that was Paul's first time in the city of Philippi, and the first church in Philippi. 
was established in the second mission trip of the Apostle Paul. But Paul did not forget the church of Philippi, and the church of Philippi did not forget Paul, because we know that the church of Philippi it continuously provide the missionary needs, financial needs for Paul. And on Paul's third missionary journey, he returned to Macedonia again to exhort the newly formed church and then set up for Greece. Now, he dwelt three months in Greece. Now, the original plan was this. He wants to sail back to Syria. He could probably take the path from Korean, some will trust, some will cause this path. But he knew that some Jews were trying to kill him, to trap him. So he took another U-turn from Macedonia again into Philippi, into Neapolis. So again, while Paul was in Philippi, again in his third mission trip, he again absorbed and built up the church bonding, fostering relationship with the church. So, just as Paul was accomplishing this goal and delivered some donation from each churches in European country to Jerusalem, and he was arrested. Finally, he was placed under the house arrest at his residence in Rome. The Book of Acts, chapter twenty-eight, verses thirty to thirty-one. Now, by this time, the Philippian church knew that they had not been supporting Apostle Paul for a long, long time, and they sensed that Paul could be in the critical situation. So they sent one、um, church member called Ephroditus, a member of the church, with a number of donation to help the Apostle Paul. Now, while on this journey, Ephroditus he became so seriously ill and almost died in the course of this mission. So while he recovered, and then he sent this、uh, donation to the Apostle Paul, and Paul also sent his personal letter to Philippi. Now, Philippian church they might have another purpose of visiting Apostle Paul through this member. They may be one. His beloved servant, his beloved brother Timothy, to come to Philippian to lead and settle some issue in the church, but because of some critical situation in the Philippian church,、um, so Paul could not do anything without Timothy. So Ephesus, he had to go alone and bring back the personal letter from Paul to Philippians, in which he gave the counsel. And advice to Philippians, and this letter is Philippians that we are about to study. So, from this background, what can we learn from Paul as a member of the church? So, first of all, that's a heart that waits on Christ, a heart that waits upon the Lord. Now, sometimes some ministry was stopped by God. But think about that. Was it the will of God? Was it out of the God's will? Think carefully. If Paul had disobeyed the vision from above and insists on going to Asia, Messiah, what would have been the consequence? We don't know. The Bible does not tell us. But in the context in which the Philippian church was founded, tells us that. It was. It is always right to go with the will of God. So wherever you go to serve in the future, maybe on church duty, maybe plant a church, a new church, maybe involved of some kind of service in the church. Listen carefully to the will of God and understand what the current needs are. And the second thing is a heart that loves the church. My friends and my family, loving the church comes at a great cost. We need to pay the price if we desire and dedicate ourselves to love the church. Now, sometimes for the sake of God's church, we may encounter same difficulties like the Apostle Paul. 
It is easy to criticize the church. We may encounter this, but it is a great challenge to pay the price of loving the church and love our brothers and sisters who are weak in faith. Paul was in prison, but his love for the church was unfailing. Can we do that, or am I willing to do that? To some extent, do we, and am I willing to die for the church? And third, a heart for Christ, a heart for Christ. And a person who loves Christ is a person who loves the church. How we treat the church stems from our relationship with Christ. The moment Paul's life changed, I don't have to tell you how much he loved the church. You can see from the Bible. Was it for money? Was it for position? Was it for his own apostleship? Of course, no, not at all. It was all for Christ, for Christ, Christ, Christ. So, do we have a heart to wait upon Lord? Do we have a heart for Christ, and do we have a heart for the church today? So, though the Book of Philippians was written almost two thousand years ago, it still speaks to every churches in every generation with power and to us. We may be in different places, situations. But we can still hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to us today, in the message they receive. Because Paul writes this in the Book of Philippians, chapter one, verse one, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, which means that through the work of Holy Spirit, all the saints, not just in Philippi, but in every generation, in every places. Will receive this precious teaching. Now, in one respect, the Book of Philipp- Philippians is an easy volume to read. Sometimes it is so easy that we forget its valuable teaching. But everything Paul say in his letter has a meaning that is something we should think about and read again and again. So this morning. Scripture is a good reminder of how we should view ourselves, and how we should view the church, the brothers and sisters around us. So here's the word of God: How it says, "Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all saints in Christ Jesus, who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ." Now, first of all, as a members of a church, what is our identity when we serve the church? We are nothing more than the servant of Jesus Christ. The letters of the ancients, like those of the modern age, had a form had had set a format at the beginning. But normally, we sign and we write our name at the at the、uh, back, at the end of the letter. But in the ancient way, they wrote their names and they greet each other in the beginning, and that was very practical. Now Paul referred to himself as the servant of Jesus Christ, and it is a strange thing in this century to call ourselves a servant, because usually when we introduce ourselves, we either say our name or we add some title before it, Mister, Missus, Miss. Um, president, doctor, CEO, and etc. And so far, we have never heard anyone introduce themselves like this. Hi, I am servant. To many people, no matter how humble it sounds, we still find it uncomfortable and inappropriate. And the word servant originally means slave. To begin with the title slave. Servants, that would sound uncomfortable in this age. But it is a great honor for Paul and Timothy to have the status of servant of Christ Jesus, and that's because Lord Jesus also consider himself as a servant and willing to took on the image of a slave to serve you and me. 
it is a high calling to be a servant of Jesus Christ. So Paul's reasoning was simple. If Christ is our Lord, we are his servant. So that kind of calling um, illustrates how he sees the relationship in Christ. If we freely and joyfully accept ourselves as servant of Christ Jesus, we will be effective in unity and ministry. So once someone in the church stops seeing, sensing himself as a servant of Christ, instead sees ourselves as deserving of a high position, some kind of achievement and benefits, and unity and effective ministry will be hard to be um, achieved. So Paul begins his letter by personally demonstrating the attitude to all believer must have, namely to imitate the one who has assumed the image of a slave, of a servant. And also this letter is addressed to saints, overseers, and deacons in Philippi. And this letter is not only dedicated to lay people, to the members in the church, but also to the pastors and the deacons, leaders in the church. And more importantly, when Paul described these people, lay people, deacons, pastors, they all call, he called these people in Christ. All who are in Christ are saints. And this is the phrase that Paul loved to use. It does not refer exclusively to those who particularly distinguish in the church, and we canonize them by the church in special way. We call them saints, and nor are they saints by the social virtues, how many, how much money they donate, what is their moral performance. No, we call them. We call each other saints because we have a special relationship. We are in unity with Christ Jesus. The old life of Christians have been wiped away as we, as the song, the hymn we have just sang just now, and we are completely a new person in Christ. So we are called saints. We belong to Christ. We no longer belong to sin. And although there is leadership levels in the church, there is pastors, leaders, lay people, but when we look at each other, we should not think of lay people as less honorable and leaders as more honorable. When the leaders are in work, the lay people are so weak, we shouldn't think in that way. Because our view is this, all people in Christ should be honored equally. Because those who are in Christ have been given a new life. And that's the way we should view our brothers and sisters in the church. And finally, Paul greeted the Philippian church with seemingly simple greeting, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's not an empty phrase because he wants to preach a message of grace and peace. Grace is the love of God for those who do not deserve it in Christ and on the cross. And by receiving this undeserved grace, we enjoy spiritual and physical peace. More importantly, we enjoy peace with God. So Paul also reminds us that the grace and the peace that we enjoy every single day, it is from God the Father. And by that, we should give thanks to Christ, to God, for the grace and peace He gave us. Now, there is something for us to think about, both before the Philippian church was formed and in Paul's letter to the Philippian church. In the process of evangelism and church planting, we all need to learn to look to God and pay a close attention. What is His will? And also, what is our attitude towards the church? Do we do it all for Christ? And at the same time, 
Let us imitate Paul, as how Paul imitated Christ in loving and protecting the church as a humble servant. So that is the first sermon for the Book of Philippians today. So in this year, we will go through the Book of Philippians. We'll be seeing many characteristics, ideas, theology, teaching in the Book of Philippians. How can we be a well church? Let us pray together. Father, as we come before you, we thank you for the experience of the Apostle Paul. We thank you for how you be and help him, empower him in his ministry. So as we've seen and experienced this, so help us also, Father. We pray that as we go through the Book of Philippians, let us know that how we should. Um, how should we behave towards our church? How should we? What should we do in the church? How should we love the brothers and sisters in the church? Though the earthly church is not always perfect, there is some mistakes, sin, and flaw inside it. But Father teaches to love the church at all costs. Though we are weak. Help us and empowers us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.